This episode of the Newberry Report is sponsored by Payfully. Renting your home or spare room can be a great way to earn some extra income, but actually getting paid can take months. That's where Payfully comes in. Payfully is a safe and secure way to get paid for your upcoming reservations within 24 hours of them being booked. Payfully deposits directly into your bank account with funds usually available the same day. It works with all the major platforms, Airbnb, VRBO, HomeAway, and others, and they've helped thousands of hosts expand their business or cover unexpected expenses. Visit payfully.co, that's P-A-Y-F-U-L-L-Y dot C-O, for $20 off your first request with code NEWBERRY. That's payfully.co, promo code NEWBERRY, N-E-W-B-E-R-Y. Welcome to the Newberry Report, where every two weeks we discuss a book that won the Newberry Medal, which is an award given every year by the American Library Association for the most distinguished contribution to American literature for children. And today, 1971's winner, The Summer of the Swans by Betsy Byers. I have joining me today, Carolyn Burns. How are you, Carolyn? I'm great, Carrie. How are you? Good, thank you. And I also have joining Carolyn and myself is uh, Steph Leakey. How are you, Steph? Oh, I'm wonderful. How are you two doing? <laughs> Great. We are doing fine. <laughs> Great so far, to hear. perfectly natural, perfectly normal podcasting recording experience. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so Great. Uh, why don't we start with a, uh, it's probably the best way for the audience to catch up in case you haven't read it, um, is Carolyn, why don't you give us a summary of The Summer of the Swans? Sure. Uh, so Summer of the Swans, uh, our main character in there is Sarah, who is having just like the worst summer, like ever. Uh, so Sarah is dealing with all of her newfound teenage angst. Uh, normally would have had just a fun, productive summer, now is just bitter and sad uh, and and self-deprecating time of her life. Um, so so Sarah lives with her sister Wanda and her uh, mentally handicapped younger brother Charlie. Uh, they live with their aunt Willie um, after their mother's untimely death and their father's subsequent abandonment of his children. So, <laughs> uh, so one morning Sarah decides she's going to walk down to a local lake where uh, this group of swans has taken residence for the summer. So she takes Charlie along with her. They spend some time with the swans and and then later that night, once everyone's in bed, Charlie decides on his own that he wants to go back and revisit the swans. So he leaves the house, but uh, unfortunately in his journey out, he is spooked by some dogs and he ends up getting lost in the woods. So the next morning the family wakes up and that's when they realize that Charlie has gone missing. So they set out to find him. And as Sarah, being the brilliant, wonderful kid detective she is, realizes that Charlie has most likely gone back to the lake to revisit the swans. So she heads out into the forest along with her best friend, Mary, who is very much not interested in going with her um, and is, is, is instead more interested in going to a fun birthday party that's happening later that night. And Sarah's arch nemesis and number one rival, Joe Melby, who is a kid in her class that she holds a massive grudge against due to uh, her belief that he wants stole Charlie's watch, uh, which is a big no-no. Um, so her and Joe and Mary, you know, ducks out after five minutes of searching, uh, are spend the afternoon in the woods. They're searching for Charlie. Um, eventually it comes out that Joe is not the bad guy she made him out to be. In fact, he has had Charlie's back the whole time. Uh, and she begins to sort of realize that people are actually complex, nuanced people and not um, just dudes that steal her brother's watch. Uh, so eventually Joe and Sarah find Charlie. He's a little short up but physically intact um, they return home and this is when Joe invites Sarah uh, to be his date to that big birthday party tonight um, so the novel ends with a phone call between Sarah and her father uh, and her father instead of immediately coming to aid in the search for his mentally disabled missing son decided instead he was gonna wait and see sort of how things transpired over 24, 48 hours, something like that. Great guy, by the way, her dad. Uh, and she has this revelation sort of about the nature of her father and has a nice little moment and then goes and gets ready for the party. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to not read too much into your sarcasm as I ask this next question. Briefly, <laughs> what did you each think of the book? 
I wasn't the biggest fan of this book. Um, I mean, there are elements of it that I did enjoy, um, but as a great piece of children's literature, I don't think it fit the bill for me personally. Uh, Carrie, there's just so much teenage angst in this book. <laughs> you know, uh, it's fine, but I we all just heard me read the description. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't like it. I, fine. It's not that I didn't like it. It's just very like, oh my God, the end of the world uh, in, in just the smallest ways. I, I don't know. It, I think the book was trying to be profound, you know, mentally disabled, uh, disabled child, absentee father, you know, all of these big complex uh, things that Sarah is dealing with. And it just fell flat, really, for me. I'm going to disagree with both of you. Uh, this is, I hadn't read this book before, but this type of book and the and what goes on in this book is one of the reasons that I love children's literature so much. Because what Sarah describes feels acutely accurate to not only herself, but also myself at that time and that age. And to hear it articulated by somebody else who did not know me <laughs> reminds me that it's okay and that I wasn't the only person to feel that way and provides me some sort of retroactive perspective. And if I had read it at the time, it would have been deeply uh, alleviating to read. So I may make it my objective to get you guys to like this book by the end of this podcasting recording session. Challenge accepted. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, as is not surprising, um, there's a, a item of controversy that we need to look at before we can talk about this book, just to sort of get it out of the way up top and address how we feel about it. Now, um, as you mentioned, Carolyn, Charlie, the younger brother of Sarah, is um, mentally debilitated or handicapped in some way that's not ever clearly stated because it doesn't seem like they have the the means to sort of diagnose whatever it is is going on. Um, do we feel like the depiction of Charlie is either sort of quote unquote fair or accurate? Um, or do we feel like it's sort of a caricature of whatever he might be? Um, I mean, in my mind, it was fair. I feel like if this book was trying to push the envelope a little bit more, maybe they would have delved into Charlie a bit more. I don't know. I felt like throughout this book, I would have preferred less Sarah and a little bit more Charlie to gain an understanding of um, his mental state because, and I'm sure a lot of us felt that he was way younger at the start than realizing how old he was, like, oh, snap, okay. Um, but yeah, I just... I felt maybe there could have been a little bit more to have a better understanding of what he actually had or at least be able to understand it because it's very vague throughout. Yeah, Charlie's description was really odd. You had this sort of inner world uh, versus outer world that that there was a little bit of disconnect in how they were portrayed by the author. Because um, the way that the book is formatted is that most of it is in Sarah's point of view, but there are these sort of standalone chapters that go off and then it's done with this narration from Charlie's point of view. And it's very intelligent and very self-aware. You know, you're led to believe that Charlie is this very like simple sort of child that that doesn't have the ability to have like sort of complex emotions or thoughts and feelings and things like that. And then we have these sudden chapters that that don't really appear until a, a decent amount of way through the book that show him as as a very intellectually stimulated child. Um, and it sort of got me sort of thinking on the train of like, okay, well, then is he a non-speaking autistic? Is that a possibility? But they say that his disability came from this brain fever that he had when he was really young, which is not typically how autism works. And uh, and you start to sort of think, you're like, how complex is the character of Charlie? Or is this all just the fault of the author who's who wants him to truly be, you know, just like a simpleton child, but when it comes to his chapters is is just blowing his experience of the world into having this narrative quality that makes it more interesting to read. Like, I don't know which is which. Yeah, f for me, though, I think I think it was sort of supposed to take place outside of the world that we live in, um, and it wasn't going to get a name. It wasn't going to get a diagnosis because... 
the characters in the book themselves weren't totally 100% confident on what was going on in his inner life. And so what we're getting is this like understanding of how uh, Sarah and Aunt Willie and everyone else perceive Charlie. And then, yeah, you're right. We do get these, um, when he's lost in the woods, we do get these chapters that describe theoretically what he's he's thinking and feeling. There's the, We have these this logic projected on him that... Um, it feels all just very literary. It doesn't. F- it's hard to tell if it's based in any sort of reality of what, how a, a child would, how a, any child I think would think or operate in a time like that. Let alone one that has difficulty expressing um, thoughts. I guess the thing that I found a little bit weird is at some point in the book we get an understanding that there is this link between Sarah and Charlie. This level of understanding. So clearly, in some regard, Sarah is at least intuitive in the sense to know that there is more to Charlie than what everyone else thinks. Um, for him, for her, he's, you know, the normal annoying brother. It just so happens that he can't speak and has this disability attached to him. But there is this link between the two of them where in some way it feels like she knows that there's more to him than what's everyone else believes and things. I don't know if you guys agree or disagree with that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, they're closer in age than Sarah and Wanda are um, approximately six years apart. I don't think we get an exact age for Sarah, but she's somewhere in the neighborhood of 14. um, And the sister's 19, so that's five years apart. And then Charlie's um, 10. So they've been closer for longer, uh, particularly before puberty. Like, you can sort of lump those kids together in a little bit in a family, and, like, they have the little kids and the big kids, right? And so they've been little kids together for much longer than um, than Wanda's been a little kid along with them. So she's certainly much more connected than to, to Charlie than she is to Wanda. And I think, similarly, she can sort of project onto Charlie. Not to say that she's not intuiting how he's feeling appropriately but i think um as with anybody that's you know the quieter person in in a friendship or relationship you can project onto them (laughs) that they're understanding or agreeing with you because they don't ask questions so um this book you know and one of the reasons that i you know really closely connect to what's going on to it is is that it's about puberty whether or not it sort of directly states it all of the signs lead to oh she's going through puberty right now are you now. currently going through puberty carrie not again but but i i feel like a lot of people <laughs> that that was a very poignant time in my life that i really that's the first time that you sort of like if you think about it back about your memories i think that's the first time that i can follow the logic of the world that i was in at the time and that like if i think back to being 13 14 I know why I made choices that I made and I can identify with that logic. If I think back to 10 or 6, I don't know why I was doing things. I don't know why I wouldn't eat cheese one week and then only ate cheese off pizza the next week, you know? Whereas, like, I know why I was nervous to go to dances at 13, you know, or why I chose to take certain classes at 14. So it's the first point at which you start to identify with the sort of person you're going to end up being. And so Sarah's going through puberty and dealing with these huge emotional changes and where she feels a lot of things really extremely, as I assume you guys both remember doing and uh, or not. Not like her. (laughs) Not like her. Um, And and there's this one moment that happens really early on that is so telling. She says to Charlie, Charlie, I'll tell you something. This has been the worst summer of my life. And she's saying that on page six. Like, Charlie hasn't even gone missing yet. Sarah has no idea what's about to happen. And also, her mother died six years ago. So that doesn't count as the worst summer of her life. Or in that moment, she's unable to, like, see outside of herself because this change is just, like, so insane. But you have to be... You have to be sympathetic for her. And, and, and that's all I'm able to feel for her the whole time. Um, and there's this quote a little later on that really hit home for me. Up until this year, it seemed, her life had flowed along with rhythmic evenness. The first 14 years of her life all seemed the same. She had loved her sister without envy, her aunt without finding her course, her brother without pity. Now all that changed. She was filled with a discontent, an anger about herself, her life, her family that made her think she would never be content again. Oh, you know, of course. 
that's so, I don't know. I feel like that a lot still. <laughs> and it's not. And what's what's the ho- most heartbreaking is it's not her fault. Like this is just the natural course and way of things that she has to learn how to cope with if she's going to be an adult in this world. And and so we have this intense. This is all a big build up, <laughs> not not a therapy session. This is all a big build up to a question, which is we have this intense, extreme emotional change, hormonal change that happens for. Is everyone getting grossed out every time I say the word hormonal? No, everyone's okay. Great. So Sarah has this huge emotional hormonal change. At the same time that Charlie goes through what's probably the most scary, terrifying experience of his memory, because presumably he doesn't remember getting this um, life-threatening fever when he was a child. It's so, to me, it's so, this juxtaposition is so fascinating, because at the same time that Sarah is getting inwardly pulled and discovering a whole new way to think about herself, about her relationships, and about how she functions in the world... At the same time she's being pulled in, Charlie is literally pulled out, out of his comfort zone, in, in the same way that Sarah is pulled in and outside of her comfort zone, because inside of her is not a comfortable place, at least now. And I think that that is a fantastic lesson for anybody to read while they're going through puberty, right? Like, yes, y- there is weight to these feelings. And yes, you are, they're, you're not making them up. You are feeling those things. They are true. They do have weight. You do deserve to to explore them. But also the world is still going on and you have to connect to it. Well, it's a, it's a great heightening device. You know, you have, you could have a story about puberty that just is about a girl having all of those wonderful quotes and all of those great internal struggles that Sarah is currently having going through this sort of very difficult time in her life and have it just be, you know, also there's a pool party and she doesn't want to wear a bathing suit. Like you could just make it regular everyday sort of teenage stuff. And I think it's just really interesting to take all of those feelings and all of that inner turmoil and put it now through the lens of something actually bad is happening. Every teenager in the world can sit there and say, this is the worst summer of my life. Or like, I hate my life or like this are is you there just... god it's me margaret <laughs> exactly they they can have these big like oh life is terrible about nothingness but to have that life is terrible mentality and then have your mentally disabled brother go missing into what could very easily end with his life being lost you know with all of these very dire consequences as a possibility uh it's just a great lens to put that puberty through absolutely uh, yeah, for me, it was so resonant because the author doesn't judge. I don't think. I mean, you guys can tell me if you felt that Sarah was being judged, but I don't think the author is judging her. And I think that's so crucial because so often parents, I feel like, are like, all right, you're just feeling this because you're at this time or you're, you're they're sort of putting those feelings in a box that sort of label them inadvertently as inappropriate because they're saying you're going to grow out of them, which is a really unfair way to approach those feelings because it's a, it, it's huge. It's such a, that's why there's a whole milieu of books about puberty, you know? And I can't help but see to be, particularly for girls, I can't help to, but to be sympathetic for someone in that position because it was the worst. Uh, and yeah, I've experienced way worse things than puberty, but there's no way to strip away the both unique and acute impact that puberty has on everyone. I think the nice thing at least is the fact that um, Sarah had at least her sister to help counteract that, um, to alleviate some of the <laughs> the typical teen angst. Um, and just the fact that, you know, having someone who's close enough in age to her who has gone through that experience be almost like her bestie, so to speak, helps in dealing with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. She never... Uh, That's great. Wanda never condescends, I don't think, to Sarah at all. In fact, when Sarah starts to go off on these like, "Mm, what was me tangents, she says to her, I'm going to quote it again. (laughs) She says, we know. (laughs) Honestly, Sarah, I hope you're not going to start listing all the million things wrong with you because I just don't want to hear it again. Like that, that doesn't say that there's anything wrong with her or that she's thinking even inaccurately. She's just saying this (laughs) is not a conversation I want to interact with. And she follows that up with, you know, Sarah's complaining about her shoe size. 
And she said her feet are too big, which I don't know why Wanda doesn't say we have the same size feet, because presumably they would, right? Or, or awfully similar. But anyway, she says, you wear the same size shoes as Jackie Kennedy Onassis, if it makes you feel any better. Like, what a lovely um, correlation to draw. I mean, it's slightly dated now, but like at the time, you know, and I think still even people emulate Jack, um, Jackie Kennedy Onassis, like a lot and so to hear oh you are the same as her was like quite possibly one of the best things she could have said in that moment um because you know actually i'll undercut my own point because if she had said you have the same size feet as me that would not have made her feel better she would have said oh you're 19 or yeah but you have great facial facial structure work or you know like (laughs) there would have been a way to undercut it but by immediately connecting her to this paragon of beauty and class and grace the sister says possibly the best thing in that moment don't go anywhere we'll be right back after this race car radio is proud to support the work of io worldwide a tenacious and dedicated organization working to address the root causes of poverty in west africa because they believe that who a person is and where they come from should not solely determine what they are able to achieve. To learn about their work and how you can support it, please visit ayaworldwide.org. Hello, listeners. Are you a business owner? Your next customer might be listening right now, just like you are. You can let them know who you are by sponsoring this show. Just email us at hello at citizenracecar.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at citizenracecar.com. And now back to the Summer of the Swans. I want to keep going with what you're talking about, Steph, about these relationships. Because I think Mary, for all her flaws and wanting to go to this birthday party (laughs) while Charlie's missing, is a really good friend to Sarah, um, I don't know. Oh, Carrie's getting her quotes ready. <laughs> I know she's going to back up. I have no quotes for this. <laughs> uh, I, I felt very ambivalent towards Mary's character. You know, I mean, you have you have all the reasons to dislike her. You know, she basically abandons her friend who is searching for her. I can't I can't say it enough. Searching for her mentally disabled, lost 10 year old brother. Which she doesn't begrudge her for because I I know I begrudge her for I understand, it. <laughs> I understand what you're saying, but but because they're all going through these changes at this time, they don't possess the sense of perspective yet. They're learning it, but they have to go through this moment first in order to gain a perspective. And I think that begrudging poor Mary for not having a breath of experience that she hasn't had yet is just asking too much of a child. I will make your point for you that when I was... 14, I remember uh, a family member, like a, a distant family member passed away and was not one that I was close to. And we had to travel to Michigan to go to the funeral. And I remember literally throwing a hissy fit on my floor because it was my friend's birthday party that weekend and I didn't want to travel. Uh, and that's it. I'm just sharing how I'm the Mary of this group, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but there's nothing you couldn't have known, you know, you couldn't have known the weight of death yet. Yeah, that's that's so it's so unfair to presume that I hadn't read Sounder yet. You hadn't read Sounder. <laughs> <laughs> no dead dog books. I'm sorry, we cut you off, Steph. What were you going to say? I mean, clearly I had a very different experience as a teenager than you guys did, um, because I knowing me as a child or I was very close with or I was very protective of my siblings in the sense that like we also had a neighbor who was like family to us and if anything were to happen he was there and I was also there for his family um so it just I don't know for me I was I felt like I was like a little bit aware or at least like when I look at a or looked at a situation that was high stakes I would at least be like oh let me <laughs> go and do the right thing and not be selfish so i'm not the mary of the group yeah i totally respect that it's a it's an extremely privileged viewpoint and vantage point to come from of like oh you haven't had bad experiences you have no uh schema by which to interpret them and move forward with them but i I don't know that's what i i just want all children to have that experience and to not know and unfortunately that's for better or for worse the pain that comes with not knowing is you don't have the experience or understanding to 
properly, quote unquote, handle a painful or terrible situation. Um, I mean, Sarah was uh, 14 minus six, nine years old. <laughs> no, eight. Eight. 14 minus six. We're going to cut that out. She's going to cut it right out. Don't edit it. Don't edit that out. Um, she was eight years old when her mother died. So she may or may not have had a firm understanding of what that meant. And the father leaving... I think that that was, I I found that really excellently handled because the father doesn't leave because he doesn't want the children. He leaves because they need the money and he certainly didn't know how to interact with them. And so unfortunately that also was the best choice to make in that situation where he didn't know how to deal with his wife dying. He knew that he had responsibilities as a father to these three children and Aunt Willie was just going to be better at raising the kids than he was. And I think Aunt Willie's doing a great job. They're great kids. (laughs) Yeah, I, you know, I'll never say that the father didn't make the right decision, but it, it, just because it's the right decision doesn't mean that there aren't repercussions to that. Absolutely. And that, I think, is is so much of this book and so much of Sarah's character is how she relates to her father's abandonment uh, of her and her siblings and, and how that really trickles down into the daily interactions that she has with all of these other characters. Yeah, so... This book does have a lot of, um, at least for the type of life that they're living, a lot of hardship. Um, You know, the mother dies really early. Charlie has a life-threatening sickness young in his life um, that has debilitated him in terms of um, at least expression, at least as far as he's able to communicate to people, has debilitated him. Um, The father is all but absent. and that's that seems to be a lot harder than at least the lives of the friends are, especially Mary. Mary's life seems to be going pretty great. <laughs> um, there's another wonderful moment about Mary that I just have to share because she's so fantastic. There's just something about Mary. There's something <laughs> about Mary. Um, yeah. Um, so <laughs> another wonderful thing about Mary is that she sticks with Sarah, even though Sarah isn't always the best friend to her. Um, Aunt Willie has has expressed that she thinks Charlie is lost in the coal mine. Um, And Sarah knows that to not be true. And she says, um, Charlie wouldn't go there. Remember that time we were in the Bryant cellar after they moved out? And he wouldn't even come in there because it was cold and dark and scary? And then Mary says, yes, I do remember. Because I sprained my ankle jumping down the window and had to wait two hours while you look through old life magazines. I was not looking through old life magazines. Mary says, I could hear you. I was down in the dark cellar with the rats and you were upstairs and I was yelling for help and you kept saying, I'm going for help right now. And I could hear the pages turning and turning and turning. Sarah says, well, I got you out, didn't I? (laughs) Mary says, finally. (laughs) Sarah pauses again. Charlie, Charlie. And the girls start looking for Charlie again. And that Mary helps her dye her shoes to that awful puce color. It's just, I just have to put another... Um, another positive mark in there for Mary. So um, there's this other moment where Sarah is talking about how she really wants this dress. She really wants it. And Aunt Willie says, no, I'm going to make it for you. I'm not going to buy it. It's too expensive. I'm going to make it. Mary says, did you buy your dress yesterday? And Sarah says, no. Why not? I thought your aunt said you could. She did. But when we got to the store, she said she saw how much it cost. And she said it was foolish to pay so much for a dress when she could make me one just like it disappointment yes because unfortunately she can't make one just like it she can make one kind of like it you remember how the stripes came together diagonally in front of the dress well she already has mine cut out and i can see that not one stripe meets oh sarah i could see when she was cutting it that the stripes weren't going to meet and i kept saying it's not right aunt willie the stripes aren't going to meet and all the while i'm screaming the scissors are flashing and she's muttering the stripes will meet the stripes will meet and then she holds it up in great triumph and not one stripe meets. Mary says, that's awful, because I remember thinking when you showed me the dress that it was the way the stripes met that looked so good. So, so sweet. (laughs) (laughs) What? You know, it's interesting just because for being a book that is not about their friendship. It's not one of those young adult novels that's about the power of friendship and mm-hmm. the power that these relationships hold for these young people. She writes them so well. You know, the, these two characters and their their sort of interaction with each other, it's it's they 
bicker like you would expect two best friends to and they understand each other in such like a visceral and and deep rooted way that I thought was written so poignantly and yet played a very small role in this book uh, and in some ways is a credit to Betsy Byers for being able to pull that off but also I'm like well let's hear more about that <laughs> When they were out of earshot, Sarah said, Aunt Willie thinks she knows everything. I get so sick of hearing how I'm exactly like Wanda when Wanda is beautiful. I think she's just beautiful. If I could look like anyone in the world, I would want to look like her. Um, She kicked up some high grass by the sidewalk. And it does too matter how you look. I can tell you that. She walked around angrily um, for a few steps, then waited for Charlie and took his hand again. I think how you look is the most important thing in the world. If you look cute, you are cute. If you look smart, you are smart. And if you don't look like anything, then you aren't anything. Yeah, this is her prevailing philosophy throughout the book, which I, I'm, I'm curious if you guys think changes at all. Because she starts the book with this very strong statement, this, this very strong philosophy of how you look is how you are. And that's true. Like, whatever you're, you're, you're perceived as, that's your reality. And that's, that seems to be a thing one would grow out of. Do you guys think that that changes for her over the course of the, of the book? I think at least it... Oh, and I hate to bring up the lovely boy. Um, but I think in a small... Why do you hate, menis- why do you hate a, to bring him up? Uh, because of that whole idea of feeling validated by the guy asking you to the party. Um, But in a small way, it seems like during, you know, the search for Charlie, having him there um, in some way changed a little bit of her thinking um, overall, which still kind of bothers me in a way. I can't remember if you, Carolyn, kind of touched on that fact, but just having that validation just felt... uh, Barf City to me. Um, it is. I think that that was one of the strongest things that I uh, that I reacted to in this book was the the ending, which basically was you know Charlie is found. They come out and uh, Joe asks her to the dance, and and just my whole interpretation of that moment was exactly what you said, which is validation. It's she spent half the book critiquing him for being such. Uh, a terrible person, you know, and, and when she finds out that she misunderstood the situation and he, in fact, is not a terrible person and, and actually appears to be a really great guy, has has volunteered to help her find her brother and, and has been there supporting her, she still is kind of murky about him. And then he asks her to the to the party, and it's like all of that evaporates. And uh, you know that's my that's my interpretation. I know that there are different ways of writing that. It's not as cut and dry in that in the actual text, but it is worth noting that I f- I had the same response to that. I think at this point it probably feels cliche in a way that um, it was just more prevalent. You know, I don't I don't think I think now we sort of have um, the luxury of like Disney movies like Brave, <laughs> where she doesn't get married at the end. You know. And I didn't, I've been thinking a lot about this because I know this is something that in our initial talks was a, was a concern. And I, I have to think that that's unfair to Joe, too, because I think Joe has, for kind of the first time, found someone that communicates and thinks on a level as deep as he does. You know, and if we think about what's not what we don't see, which is presumably Joe's puberty (laughs) or hormonal story, you know, he doesn't like the way that the other kids interact with Charlie. He doesn't fit in super well. It seems like he's willing to to leave all of his friends on the baseball field to help her find her brother before she before he even knows that something is really wrong. Unlike Mary. (laughs) Mary does go with her for the beginning. But but I don't think either of us are are. Yeah. Look down on Joe. Joe yeah. is a wonderful character. Yeah. It's it's more the fact that this was even written in. You know, it, it is an older text and it is from the 70s and there is sort of this this historical leeway you can give people for saying like, well, that's how things were or that's how well, people yeah, thought. I didn't, but, I didn't mean, you're right. But, I didn't mean but there, you know, I, I yeah. am as a reader in today's day and age and at the age that I currently am, I'm reading this through the eyes of, of a feminist and understanding what the actual uh, like meat is behind what just happened there and it's it it was just a little bit off-putting
So the illusion of life, our, our um, regular segment, <laughs> um, what moment sort of stuck out for us as like the most articulate understanding of the way that life works? Um, Steph, do you want to read it for us? Oh, sure. Um, a picture came into her mind of the laughing, curly-headed man with the broken tooth in the photograph album, and she suddenly saw life as a series of huge, uneven steps. And she saw herself on the steps, standing motionless in her prison shirt, and she had just taken an enormous step out of the shadows, and she was standing, waiting, and there were other steps in front of her so that she could go as high as the sky, and she saw Charlie on a flight of small, difficult steps, and her father down at the bottom of the steps, just sitting and not trying to go further. She saw everyone she knew on those blinding white steps, and for a moment everything was clearer than it had ever been. So great, right? <laughs> I mean, life is a big M.C. Escher painting, right? <laughs> Clearly. Uh, yeah, I think that speaks for itself, unless you want to... No, no we yeah? agree. Yeah. I, you know. Uh, yeah. What? Mm-hmm. At least. It's, it's certainly telling of how she still views her father, even after her little mini epiphany that she has. It, it's still... Uh, it's... It's still showing that she she has some growing left to do and some understanding left to do. Um, but at least he's in the picture now. Whereas yeah. mm-hmm. if she had had this stare vision at the beginning, I don't even think he would have been in it. True. Yeah. Great. So now it's our rating section. Um, Carolyn, do you have a sound effect for this one? Or <laughs> I thought about it, and then I was like, Carolyn, two in a row, you're going to have to do it every time. <laughs> uh, I did not bring a sound effect, unfortunately. Um, I I did like this book. Um, and I, I want to rate it. Did I win? I won. I won you over. No. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm going to, I'm going to rate mine on a scale of four instead of out of five this time, because I want to go straight in the middle. Was it out of five previous times? Yes, Yes. it is. But this time it's out of four because I want to give it two puce shoes. (laughs) (laughs) But out of four. So it's like, it's like right in the middle for me. It's like halfway there. I guess I'm going to do my rating out of five still. Um, and I'm going to give this one a one and a half swimming swans. So it feels like what a, is a half swan. <laughs> <laughs> Just the head and part of the body. Well, I'm not going to do it out of any number. I'm just going to give this one sweet motor scooter ride. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you so much. That has been uh, The Summer of the Swans by Betsy Byers. You have two weeks to read our next book, which is uh, the 1972 winner, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, group favorite, by Robert C. O'Brien. So get on that. That's your homework for this week. I just want to, before we wrap up, say thank you so much, Steph Leakey, for joining us. No problem. <laughs> thank you, Carolyn Burns, for joining us. Oh, my God. Thank you, like, so much. <laughs> uh, this has been, like, the best podcast experience of my life. <laughs> thank you so much for listening. Join the conversation and tell us what you thought about the book at facebook.com slash Newberry Report. That's N-E-W-B-E-R-Y Report. The Newberry Report is hosted and recorded by me, Carrie Caston. And my co-host is Carolyn Burns, with our special guest today, Steph Leakey. It was co-produced and edited by David Hoffman. It's a production of Race Car Radio. If you're not already subscribed to our show, you can do so on iTunes or Google Play, or head to www.racecarradio.com. Race Car Radio is a division of Citizen Race Car. We tell stories.